the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now and, and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to Fireside with Fathers. It's great to actually have live Firesides. This is something that we're going to hopefully bring back. Um, we're with Pat Kenny today. So Pat Kenny is going to tell us who Father Willie Doyle is. Is um, For me, I've been woken up, I think, in a lot of aspects as far as my priesthood goes, just starting to read his letters. Um, there's a documentary on EWTN as well. Um, that you can find. We'll put that in the description afterwards. But um, Pat Kenny, you would be, I'd say, pretty much an expert here on Father Willie Doyle. Thanks be to God. We have some relics here as well on the table that hopefully we'll be showing you guys as well. I think, I honestly feel like there's there's something very surreal here with the, the relics just in front of us because this guy has become uh, like an overnight hero for me. But um, first of all, just maybe tell us a bit about yourself, uh, who you are, what you do, if you have family. Yep. Okay. Hi, Father Luke. Great to be here. Uh, so as you said, my name is Pat Kenny. Um, I'm married and a father of six children. I don't know if they're watching live at home or not. If you are, go straight to bed after the end <laughs> of the program uh, and behave. Um, but I'll be watching tomorrow anyway if they didn't watch live. Uh, so as I said, I have six children. I'm a lecturer in Technological University Dublin in the Faculty of Business. So nothing to do with this type of thing at all. Um, but I'm also the president of the Father Willie Doyle Association, which is a private association of the faithful, which we launched just last week. And our website is williedoyle.org. Uh, you can go and check it out and see more information about Father Willie there. And so the purpose of the association is really to make Father Willie more well known, um, to promote his memory and his legacy and his spiritual message, but also ultimately to try and work towards opening his cause for canonization. And there's a lot of people around the world who have a devotion to him. Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence of holiness in his life, and I think he would be a worthy uh, candidate for canonization. And uh, if I was to give a summary of who Father Willie Doyle is, I would say basically he was a man, a Jesuit priest, a military chaplain who loved God and his neighbors so much that he was willing to lay down his life in order to save a soul or to save a life. And what's really interesting in all of that is that he did it as a victim soul. He was he felt a call to offer up his life in reparation for the sins of priests. And that's exactly what happened to him in August 1917, in the middle of World War I, where he laid down his life when he rushed out of the trenches in order to rescue two wounded soldiers. Very heroic figure, a very, very holy figure, a man of, of great transformation and healing in his own life because he, he didn't start out being that strong. Uh, and I think we have a lot to learn from his example. So World War I, I'm just saying like a be People are talking a lot about war nowadays. A lot of kids are playing uh, video games that have to do with war. Mm -hmm. um, but like World War One, the context of World War One, especially in Ireland as well, is a different context. But you're not just talking about any other war here. No, I mean it was it was a brutal war. I mean at the time it was called the Great War, or to war the war to end all wars. Um, it was I suppose the first industrial scale war. Um, it was a war in which chemical weapons were used, uh, mustard gas was used. Uh, as a devastating weapon um, and it was a, a horrific war because traditionally wars were men fighting in a field and whoever won took took the field but uh, this was a war in which men were underground in trenches uh, fighting and shooting and shelling each other trying to get a few more inches of, of ground and uh, very often the men were stuck in stalemate and stuck in trenches uh, in horrific circumstances, in, in boiling heat, in, in floods, in mud, in snow, surrounded by rats and fleas and all sorts of vermin, surrounded by dead bodies. So an absolutely horrific uh, war. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, young, young guys may play computer games about war, but the reality is, is, yeah. is horrific. And Father William himself was not a fan of the war. He went to be with, with men and to save them and, and to bring the gospel to them and to be with them at the most important moment of our life, which is the moment of our death. Um, but he himself said, look, if, if, if people, if generals or politicians knew the reality of war, uh, they would want peace. And how do we have so much information? Like as far as Willie, do we how do we know so much about him? Yeah, so we know a lot about him for two reasons. Um, number one, he was a good, solid, traditional Jesuit, which meant he took a lot of notes. Um, he, you know, St. Ignatius would have encouraged his followers to take a lot of notes about their spiritual lives. And Father Willie did that in terms of his private diaries and notebooks. 
But also he wrote so many letters home uh, to his father. His mother had died by the time the war started. Um, he loved his father very much and uh, wrote many, 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 many letters home to him. And he's a very significant figure in terms of the Irish in World War One. If you open up any book about Ireland and World War One, Father Willie Doyle is guaranteed to be in that book. Hmm. His letters are a very valuable first hand account of what it was like for the Irish in World War One. And what's remarkable about the letters is how cheerful he is in the, in the letters. Um, he's surrounded by death. He's surrounded by destruction. He's risking his life on an almost daily basis. And yet he's telling jokes in the letters. He's not making light of the war. I mean, he's, he's deadly serious. But there's a joy in his heart and there's a cheerfulness in his heart, which is which is incredible in many ways. Um, but he's also writing those letters because he knows his father is worried about him and he's sending those letters home to cheer up his father. He's writing those letters in the trenches. Sometimes he describes up to his knees in mud. Wow. He could have been sleeping instead, but instead he's up late at night writing letters home to his father to cheer his father up. And that's another sign of his virtue for me. Instead of taking his rest, he was thinking of his father. And as far as I'm concerned, he grew up in South Dublin. So we do have a lot of Americans listening. Would that be, if you had to describe it, would he have grown up in a hard area or would it have been more It would be going? maybe the equivalent of the Upper West Side of Manhattan, perhaps uh, South Dublin. So he grew up in a very wealthy family. Or maybe not a very wealthy family, but a comfortable family. His father worked in the courts. And his father retired at about the age of 90 after a 73 year long career in the courts. So wow. the very strong work ethic in the family, which Father Willie inherited from his, his father. Um, the interesting thing about Willie when he was a, a child is um, the family had servants and he did the work of the servants. So he would get up in the morning, some, not all the time, but sometimes before the servants were up and he'd light a fire for them or he'd clean the dishes from dinner the previous night. Um, so he had a great care for others, including for the servants. And as a young boy, there were poor people in the area of Dawkey. But, you know, today Dawkey is where the rock stars and, and movie stars live. Uh, but there were some poor workers there. And Willie would go and look after them, bring them money, bring them, bring them food. He would paint their houses sometimes if they were too poor to paint them. If some of them were sick in bed, um, they didn't have Netflix or TV or computer games, obviously. So Willie would go and read books to them. So he had a great love and care for others. And there's something that he and his brother did um, at Christmas time when the local poor would come to the family's home. They would give food and money to the poor. But what he and his brother Charlie did is they would take the coins and they would clean the coins and shine them so that the poor were getting what looked like brand new coins. And you might say, well, what's the purpose of that? You know, it was still money. It can still be spent. But I think it added a certain dignity to the gift that they were giving to the poor. And I think that's just a beautiful touch um, of, of doing little things out of love. And he wow. had that spirit even as a young boy. And as far as the Jesuits go, because this this is back when, I mean, a Jesuit formation would probably be pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, did he, was this his option? Like to like as far as like a priest who goes and joining the Jesuits, was it something that he was... He felt from an early mm -hmm. age? Or? Yeah, not not initially. He wanted to be a diocesan priest. And his oldest brother uh, was in the seminary for Dublin. And he died 10 days before his ordination. He got a fever and died. Oh. So Willie wanted to replace his older brother as a diocesan priest for Dublin. But his, his next oldest brother, so Willie was the seventh in the family, the sixth uh, child, Charlie. They were inseparable friends. And Charlie had decided to become a Jesuit. And Willie really had no interest in entering religious life. He said on one occasion, I'd rather be shot than enter religious life. He just wanted to be a diocesan priest. But he went down to the Jesuit novitiate to visit his brother, who gave him a booklet on religious life by St. Alphonsus. And so Father Willie um, read that book and it changed his whole outlook on life. And it was on Christmas Day, uh, 1891, that he decided that, uh, 1890, sorry, that he decided that he would become a Jesuit. And then he entered the Jesuit novitiate in March, uh, 1891. And his formation is there. Can you see kind of like, um, I don't know if he has letters during that time or like if we can see maybe a development in his. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there certainly is. I mean, we don't have as many letters um, from his his time as a novice, um, but we do have some very important documents that he wrote. I mean, there were. There were um, two very important things that happened firstly when he was a novice and he entered an novitiate in the Diocese of Meath. Um, one of those things, and we'll reflect on it later on, is that the novitiate building went on fire 
and he was caught up in the fire along with all the other novices. They had to evacuate the building and they held, had to help put out the fire. But it had a very, very big effect on him to the point where he had to leave the novitiate because he had what's described as a complete nervous breakdown. So we don't know exactly what that was. Was it some type of depression, some type of anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder? But it was so severe that he had to leave the Jesuits for a period of time. Wow. And was then allowed back in, um, which in itself was unusual that he would be let back in because at that point there were so many vocations. Um, I think that's a very significant part of his story, because if we roll forward 20 years later, we see this man who is renowned by everyone who knew him and encountered him as a hero in the war, a man who was unflinching in the face of death. And so his life is one of incredible transformation. Uh, and also an incredible sign of hope because we live in an era where many people suffer from anxiety and worry and, and depression. And Father Willie, I think, is a real model and potential intercessor for those who worry because he came through this himself. But the other remarkable thing uh, that he wrote when he was um, 20 years of age was an offering of his life to Mary. And uh, he wrote, Darling Mother Mary, in preparation for the glorious martyrdom, which I feel assured you are going to obtain for me, on this, on this, the first day of your month, solemn, I solemnly commence my life of slow martyrdom by earnest hard work and constant self-denial. With my blood, I promise you to keep this resolution. Do you, sweet mother, assist me and obtain for me the one favour I wish and long for, to die a Jesuit martyr? So at the age of 20, he had this desire to fully give himself, to fully commit himself and offer up his life as, as a Jesuit martyr. He signed uh, that piece of paper with his blood and there's two blood uh, marks beside uh, the date. Uh, and they're actually very important because we don't have his body. His body was was destroyed. Oh, wow, yeah. um, so, you know, there's very few physical items of, of, of his body. So in a sense, it's a first class relic in a sense. Um, but he actually referred back just a couple of months before his death in World War One. He referred back to that offering of his life. So it was something that he had he had remembered. He kept that memory uh, very close to him. And he lived that life of constant self-denial from then on. It wasn't just something he wrote and forgot about, something that a, no, a novice in, in his great fervor uh, wrote. He really lived that the rest of his life. And as far as you said, like his his devotional practices and everything, because I know Father Willie also, I I did read a part there. And by the way, um, to raise the fall, and this is, we're going to put this this book also in the description. I think that's it's very accessible and it's like a bit of a brief um, biography and then his letters so we're going to put that in you guys just to get it's a very um e like efficacious way to like get to know him like a matter it's of his no own time. it's his own words yeah, yeah it's no directly it's unbelievable Father Willie, yeah. and there was a moment there where i read correct me if i'm wrong but he was saying that he felt like there was a temptation from the devil that was trying to get him to kind of like measure a bit more because like he's be, you know, he could have been a bit imprudent um you know as far as like sleep or fasting and I think he said he went a whole march there. Um, I think he had a cup of tea or something. And it was a really hard day of fasting. And then they had to march like yeah. a long ways. And he felt afterwards that it was just the temptation of the devil to kind of like tell him to hold back. So like maybe a bit of his, his penitential life or his life of sacrifice. Yeah. So, I mean, we know a lot about Father Willie's spiritual life because of the notes that he took and no one was ever meant to see those notes and uh, they, were, they were in his room in Ratfarnham Castle which is where he was stationed at the time before he went to war and uh, when he was killed it was I think mainly his brother Father Charlie who went to his room to clean it up and take out his personal effects and he found a number of boxes and written on them was a note saying to be destroyed in case of my death <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't destroy them. He looked at them and uh, the Jesuits at the time decided, no, these, these really can't be destroyed. They're too valuable. And uh, what they revealed about Father Willie was uh, like no one really realized the life that he led, a life of very intense prayer. He was a mystic ultimately, but a life of very intense self-denial, a life of very intense penance. Now, he certainly practiced um, what one, what one might call heroic uh, or very, very hard mortifications on occasion. Um, he did what was very typical of the time, you know, various penitential instruments of, you know, discipline, etc. And that's not too unusual at all at the time. Um, he did some other penances, for instance, in, in the winter, he would uh, go out into the pond in Ratfarnham Castle where he lived it was a pond. He would immerse himself up to his neck in the cold water at three in the morning to pray for sinners. Wow. 
St. Ignatius did the same. Um, so there's a variety of penances he did, and every single one of those penances, um, we can see, number one, a precedent for them in the lives of the saints. There weren't things he invented. There are things he copied from the saints. But number two, very importantly, he had permission from his superiors to do those penances. Um, his provincial referred him to a particular Jesuit to get advice on his ascetical life of penance. And uh, that advisor made very, very few changes. So he had approval for everything he did. Um, but what's significant is Father Willie had discerned and his superiors obviously had agreed that he had a particular calling to a hard life of penance in reparation for the sins of priests. Wow. Um, and it was a life that he, he felt that others weren't called to emulate him in. So his advice to other people, he certainly said do penance, but sometimes he said to people, I forbid you to do corporal penances, do your duty, but do it with love, do little things with love. Um, he would encourage people certainly to do penance and to have a definite number of penitential things they would do, but to measure them according to their strength. But as you said, he, he felt called to go a bit further um, and he felt that God was telling him, look, I look after your health. You know, you give everything to me. And uh, I think the thing about Father Willie's penitential life was that um, it was total. It was 100 percent. It was never a case of, well, I'm doing penance for 20 minutes and then I'm going back to my ordinary life of comfort. He waged a war against his comfort at every moment of every day. And that's really the remarkable thing about it. It was a constant offering of himself where he would look each day to see, look, if I have two choices, which is the hardest thing? And that's what I'm going to do. So if there's two seats to sit on, one has a back and one has a stool that doesn't have a back on it, he's going to sit on the stool. Um, if there's two places to sit, one beside the fire and one further from the fire, he's going to sit further from the fire. Um, so it was a constant uh, pursuit of offerings or sacrifices to give to God. But what I think what's really consoling for us is even though he did so much in the way of penance, he still struggled with little things. So, for instance, for him, he had a great battle over taking butter on his bread. And it seems like such a small thing, um, but he really, really struggled uh, to give up butter on his bread. So much so that St. Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei, uh, was very taken by this example of him. And he wrote okay. about him in The Way, the book The Way, point 205. He talks about the uh, man of God and his heroic battles with butter, the butter tragedy. And that was actually Father Willie Doyle that he was speaking about. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You're, look, the the whole figure of Willie, Father Willie Doyle, like I said, for me is awakening um, a priestly spirituality that I I feel is very providential and I'm hoping to get and delve more into this. Um, the, the context right now of the priests in Ireland, this is where we are, um, and I know there's a lot of people in the States who are listening to this as well, the same can be said. The mm -hmm. priest is, is the image of the priest is on the floor right now. Yeah. Um, the list of, of things you can give. But for me, when you said that battle against comfort in his heart um, as priests and hopefully what because what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to get Father Willie Doyle out there. I think mm -hmm. we, uh, hopefully like his name can get out there, his story and um, obviously do good to everybody. But I'm really feeling that this mm -hmm. is going to do a lot of good to priests because I think once that battle we start giving away in that battle against comfort, it's a big battle to mm -hmm. lose. Mm -hmm. This this whole interior mortification yeah. of, of trying to fall, you know, our crucified spouse, you know, like identifying with the victim, mm -hmm. I really believe is like, you know, very strong and important for us. And um, the fact that he gave up his life there for this victim priesthood. But this is providential. So like we have three... There's three relics here. Um, that, like I said, I feel like there's a presence here just be, like having this relic. So this is his stole that he would have been running around with on the battlefield. Yeah, he had that with him. Um, he left it behind on his visit home from the war in March 1917. But he had it with him until that point. He, he volunteered as a chaplain in 1914. He was accepted in late 1915. And then he went over to the front in early 1916. So he had that stole with him for, for about 14 months. He would have had it with him in the in the famous gas attack, the Hulk gas attack, the Battle of the Somme um, and various other. Do you want to talk like about that. that gas attack just real quick? Yeah. So he was involved in a, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier on, it was World War One as a war in which there were chemical weapons that were used. And uh, in April 1916, he describes one morning where he left the trenches and, and went back a little bit back from the trenches to say mass for some nuns in a convent. So he left at 4 a.m. He was an early riser. Um, 4 a.m. He's heading back towards um, the convent to say mass. 
and he hears some noise behind him and he looks back and he sees um, the gas, the mustard gas coming towards his men and rolling towards him. And he said that when he was leaving the trenches, he says, I vividly heard a voice in my ear saying, take your gas mask or your gas helmet, as it was called. And he said he felt it was his guardian angel who said that because he wasn't going to take his gas mask. He'd never needed it before. But he had it with him. He put it on him and he, he rushed back down in order to help the men. And it was a few days of, of uh, horrific suffering of men choking to death. Father Willie trying to save them uh, because the men couldn't breathe. who were trying to pull their own gas masks off. But of course, if they pulled them off, they would die uh, even more quickly. So he was trying to uh, keep the masks on them, uh, anoint them, uh, console them as they're dying. But he himself suffered in that gas attack and uh, he wrote a long letter home to his father after the gas attack in 1916 but he wrote another letter in 1917 a year later where he actually told his father that he almost died he himself had breathed in some of the gas and uh, the doctor thought that he was going to die on that occasion but he came through it so uh, a real real suffering uh, and one of those occasions where he was offering his life, but that offering wasn't accepted on that occasion. Yeah, I remember in the first letter, he says he'd come across the guy who had breathed it in and he was trying to take it off. Yeah. And he said it was like 10 minutes, I think, of him dragging him. Yeah. And he felt yeah. like the longest so, 10 minutes. Exactly. And, you know, Willie would have been struggling to breathe himself where the gas mask wouldn't have been very comfortable. He's trying to pull men to safety. Um, and, uh, yeah, real risk to his life on that Look, occasion. The World War, I think, yeah, the World War One context is is like I think if we were just to delve into what that means I think it also it shows the light what he's yep. doing and these little sacrifices yep. but going back to these right because I'm seeing these relics here right and uh, we just said the stole but I'm seeing for me these are this could just be a providential thing here but like the three loves of a priest so we mentioned the stole which is the priest you know as an instrument exercising the, the mercy of God the Father and, and and bringing people from a state of sin to a state of grace it's an absolute powerful ministry and it is it is it needs to be like there in the love of the priest you know like it's you, you're really never closer to exercising this this role as the, the merciful father the cross father Willie's um, devotion to the crucified is is also shown in his his mortifications because at the end of the day you're trying to unite yourself with the suffering of the Christ. But I see the mass here as well, like his his devotion to the mass and the Eucharist, and then the rosary beads. Our, our blessed mother, you you read there that which was unbelievable, his offering of his life to our blessed mother to die a martyr. So on the table here we have three relics of Father Willie Doy, and I think right here is symbolizing his three loves as a priest, which I mentioned. I think the priesthood here it is it is it's this is the summary. But could you could you get into his his devotion? I think to the Eucharist or to the Mass, because I kind of want to highlight this here. Yeah. So, well, I'll just take take a step back and just say, in terms of priesthood, firstly, I mean, he loved being a priest. It was what he wanted to do. I mean, and his family was quite religious, by the way. I mean, there were seven children, four of them had religious vocations. Um, the three boys, who who one who died before being ordained himself, and his brother Charlie, who became Jesuits, and one of his sisters, who became a nun. Um, he did a lot of work for vocations, really encouraged uh, young men and women to consider religious life or priestly vocations. And he wrote two best-selling pamphlets, uh, Shall I Be a Priest and Vocations. Um, they sold tens, if not hundreds of thousands of copies in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, he helped many dozens, if not hundreds of young people find their vocations. I got a letter once from a, uh, a retired priest in England who had been a soldier in the Second World War. And his military chaplain had given him one of Father Willie's booklets on vocations and it made up his mind. He decided to become a priest as a result. And some years later, he met the chaplain and he said, I want to thank you for giving me that booklet. It's the reason I became a priest. And the chaplain said, well, that's interesting because you're at least the 12th soldier I know who became a priest from reading those booklets. Wow. So a big, big impact. Um, but obviously the mass was was central um, to his life, his love of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, he said in the early days of the war, his biggest suffering was when he didn't have the Blessed Sacrament with him. Uh, so later on in the war, on some occasions, he did carry the Blessed Sacrament in the picks, but on other occasions he didn't. And there was one moving letter I was reading a few days ago where he's describing how um, there was a chapel a little way off. He wasn't at the chapel. He's in the ward. There's a hut with the Blessed Sacrament 
And he says, I long to go to him at night through the mud and the rain. So he had this longing to be with our Lord and the big suffering for him was to receive our Lord in the morning but not be able to be near a tabernacle for another, well, not to see the Blessed Sacrament for another 24 hours until he said Mass the next day. Um, there were occasions where obviously he had to fast before saying Mass and it would be marching during the night and um, he wouldn't eat maybe until well into the day when they stopped marching so he could have the opportunity of, of saying Mass. And this and would be the 24, how long? 24, did, yeah, yeah, the 24 maybe. I mean, very, very long period of time. And uh, he notes that it was, it was tough, but he made the sacrifice. He said, you know, they would have a few minutes to stop and have a rest and the men would have tea or have some snack or whatever. And he had a choice. Am I going to eat or am I going to fast so that when we finally stop marching, I can celebrate mass? So wow. he would not eat and he would keep marching so that he could celebrate mass. Um, he, you know, carried the Blessed Sacrament with him uh, at some points in the war so that he could give our Lord to soldiers who, who were dying as viaticum. And he describes how he had a great peace and a great privilege to carry our Lord on, on his chest and the picks around his neck and how that gave him great confidence. You know, he says, I could I could sit on a whole lot of shells, even if they blew up, I, I would be happy because I'm with our Lord. So a great love for for Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. Um, it was a very moving mass that he celebrated at the Battle of the Somme. Um, if I can just find the words for it now. Um, sorry. You're fine. Yeah. Here we go. Mass at the Battle of the Somme. Um, so the Battle of the Somme was a dreadful battle. Uh, many, many, many men died. And uh, on one occasion in autumn 1916, Father Willie got to celebrate Mass there. And he says, by cutting a piece out of the side of the trench, I was just able to stand in front of my tiny altar, a biscuit box supported on two German bayonets. God's angels, no doubt, were hovering overhead, but so were the shells, hundreds of them, and I was a little afraid that when the earth shook with the crash of the guns, the chalice might be overturned. Round about me on every side was the biggest congregation I ever had. Behind the altar, on either side and in front, row after row, sometimes crowding one upon the other, but all quiet and silent, as if they were straining their ears to catch every syllable of that tremendous act of sacrifice. But every man was dead. Some had lain there for a week and were foul and horrible to look at with faces black and green. Others had only just fallen and seemed rather sleeping than dead. But there they lay, for none had time to bury them, brave fellows, every one, friend and foe alike, while I held in my unworthy hands the God of battles, their creator and their judge, and prayed him to give rest to their souls. Surely that mass for the dead in the midst of and surrounded by the dead, was an experience not easily to be forgotten. Wow. This, like, as you're saying this, like the context that I'm, I'm always going back to our context we're living now. I just was talking to a priest yesterday and he somehow, he found out that like Ireland has the record for the quickest mass said. Um, it's not something really, you know, that we're proud of, but like, Hearing this here, you know, the, the conditions he's celebrating mm -hmm. Mass is the biscuit box and the two the bayonets, shells flying. Um, he's saying the Mass and he's yeah. going to get through the Mass. I mean, this for me, I think also to wake us up a bit in the context we're living in, to bring us back, you know, why are we rushing out of Mass or like why, where do we have to go? Like he probably had mm -hmm. legitimate reasons to be rushing or to not even say Mass or not to fast. He, and I suppose in some ways he's risking Tremendous. his life sometimes saying mass that he, he can be killed in the spots that he's in. I mean, he described on one occasion saying mass in the dugout. So the dugout would be quite a small area. So he had to say mass kneeling. And this was, you know, obviously that would normally be part of the rubrics where he'd say mass kneeling, but he had to say mass kneeling. And that was that was very important for him. You know, he, he almost saw that as a privilege that the circumstances he was in uh, forced him to say mass on his, on his knees. Um Yes. And why do you think his, do you think there's a reason why his his cause has taken so long to, to open up or to people to recognize? Yeah, so uh, there was a huge devotion to him after he died in 1917. Um, Alfred O'Rahilly, uh, a fascinating man himself, wrote what can only be described as a blockbuster biography of him. So that, I suppose, is the classic biography published in 1920, just two years 
after Willie died and it had a huge impact around the world. It was translated into half a dozen languages, went through multiple editions. Um, canonized saints read it and were influenced. I mentioned St. Josemaria Escriva. Mother Teresa was another one who adopted oh, wow. some of Father Willie's spiritual practices. St. Raphael uh, Baron Arnaz Baron, I think oh, really? around some the Spanish yeah, Trappist yeah. had an interest in him. Saint Alberto Hurtado, the Chilean yeah, Jesuit yeah. had. Um and I mean I could go on, but um the the O'Rahilly book itself is is an amazing book, a tough book. Um so I think to Race to Fallen is maybe more accessible, but the classic one is is O'Rahilly. Um so huge devotion to Father Willie. By the early nineteen thirties, there were fifty thousand letters from around the world testifying to devotion to him wow. and over six thousand letters alleging favours through his intercession. So wow. healings, alleged healings and favours. Um and they came from all over the world. I mean, they weren't just from Ireland. And this is before the time of the internet. You know, wow. I mean there are about there are close to a thousand letters from the US alleging favours through his intercession. There's a letter from um an Austrian countess. There's a letter from a 10 year old Chinese boy uh, all around the world. Um, but in fact, there were a lot of holy Jesuits in that period of time. There were contemporaries of each other. And so there were four Jesuits who were on a list to be considered for canonization at that point in time. There was Father Willie, but it was also the very famous John Sullivan. And Father Willie and John Sullivan were ordained on the same day together, the 28th of July, 1907, ordained together. Uh, it was Father James Cullen, who was the founder of the Pioneers, and it was Father Michael Brown, who was the novice master. So they were all contemporaries of each other. And it was decided on that occasion to uh, proceed with the cause of John Sullivan. So happily, John Sullivan was beatified in 2017. And there were other reasons why it was decided maybe not to proceed with Father Willie. So there wasn't unanimity about a cause for him at that point in time. Um, what's interesting is that those who knew Father Willie in his later life, especially when he was in the war, but moving towards the war, they were much more in favour of a cause. Those who knew Father Willie when he was younger were a little less sure of it. And that's really interesting because holy people aren't born as holy people. You know, we have to grow in virtue. We have to make an effort to grow in virtue. And so Willie himself had his faults. He could be uh, short tempered and impatient. Uh, I mean, he was a man of strong will. So someone with a strong will tends to have those other vices that go with it. And so those who knew him when he was younger weren't so sure about a cause. Those who knew him when he was older were sure about it because they saw how he had grown and, and developed. So it was decided at that point in time for, for those reasons uh, to maybe wait for Providence and to see what would happen. And some of the letters talk about when the cause is started again, it will be as a response to the wishes of everybody. Um, so I think there was back in the 30s and 40s um, a real expectation that the cause would come forward at a later point. And maybe this is that moment of providence. Um, I think there are a number of reasons why perhaps Father Willie's example is more relevant for us now than maybe it would have been 100 years ago. The whole idea of, as I said, to, to break down that he had and how he overcame that. I think that speaks to a young generation today in a way that maybe it wouldn't have been relevant 100 years ago to people. Um, the fact that he offered up his life in reparation for the sins of priests, I think that makes him a really, really relevant figure. And at a time of scepticism about priesthood, here is a figure we can point to of a man who would happily have laid down his life to save you. And it gets away, it does away with a lot of the scepticism that people have. And I know from speaking to many people who don't have faith that the example of Father Willie inspires and interests them. Personally, I think he's someone like St. Maximilian Kolbe or St. Damien of Molokai, men who offer up their lives to save others. And so even if you don't have faith, there's something about their life and their example that is inspiring. And I think Father Willie is in that particular mold. I think you're dead right. It's so funny how these things happen providentially because he is... I mean, he's a saint. This guy's a saint. And it's the their official declaration, please God, is going to happen shortly. But the context you mentioned, mental health amongst the youth, he's a young, he's a young guy. Uh, he runs, you know, he's having this panic attack or anxiety, whatever you want, like the amount of lads that are having that right now. And then from there to be in a World War One trench with the shells exploding, uh, the priesthood, a lot of people have been writing um they're very upset with a lot of reactions of, I mean, priests in recent times, maybe just closing the church or not being there. Um, this guy is the complete opposite. Like, his, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another example in there when he, um, 
it's in the book in one of his letters where he's in the trench, the mud, the cold, and he goes into one of those those little dugouts and he's with a, a, a doctor who's also yeah. suffering and he tells him to sleep on his back. Like, yeah. So he would lay yeah. face down in, in the mud and the doctor could spend the night on his back. Yeah. Like the, like him for them, you know, this idea of him for mm. these are, that's his flock. Yeah. And he's a priest and he's going for the flock, yeah. I think. So, yeah, I mean, and we ask why, why did he volunteer to be a chaplain in the First World War? I mean, he was living a very fruitful life as a missionary in Ireland. He was on the mission team in Ireland, Jesuit mission team. He was traveling around, preaching missions, very, very successful in those. Uh, a lot of testimony about the impact his mere presence had in the parish. You know, testimony from nuns how when he gave them blessings, they felt more grace from the blessing than they had from, one nun said, from all the retreats I've ever done. His blessing had a bigger impact on me and I had to go to the chapel and kneel down, stunned. So very fruitful life, um, but he wanted to go uh, to be with working men and help them. So his, his, I mean, he had a great love for the priesthood, for vocations, but he also had a great love for ordinary lay people and in particular for working men. He wanted to set up a, a house of retreats for them. At the time, lay people didn't go on retreats and especially not uh, working men. I mean, maybe upper class men might have gotten a chance to do a retreat, but ordinary workers didn't. And uh, he worked very hard to set up a retreat house for workers. He get, met a lot of opposition to that. Um, so it didn't happen in his lifetime. It happened after he died, they opened up a house. But when the war broke out, he saw this as an opportunity to be with those working men who were going to war. So he wanted to be with them and to be out there and to suffer with them. And uh, I mean, movingly, he describes in his letters how, um, you know, if, if I die here, my big regret will be that I can't suffer more for Jesus. I mean, that's just in, incredible. Um, but he wanted to be with the men uh, out on that periphery, as it were, suffering with them. And the story you tell of the doctor, the, the extra context there was the doctor was sick and had a fever and Willie wasn't sick and they're in a dugout. They didn't have any blankets or sheets to put on the ground. It's wet, damp ground. And so Father Willie lay face down on the ground and encouraged the doctor to lie on his back so that the doctor, who was sick at the time, could have somewhere uh, a bit warmer and a bit drier to sleep. I mean, that's a big suffering uh, for any man to do that for another man, a big offering. And that's, I think, why his his penances are very important, because they trained him to do that. Yeah. Uh, you don't just make these heroic offerings like lying face down or like risking your life out of the blue. They come from a life of faithfulness, a life of prayer, uh, a life of, life of faithfulness in little things. As our yeah. Lord said, from he who is faithful in little things, then will be faithful in much. And that was the spirit that Father Willie lived with. Yeah, it's a mixture there of being used to doing these voluntary actions and being so close to the heart of Christ yeah. that in that moment they both come together. And it's, uh, I get goosebumps really. But the third thing you mentioned there of why he's relevant now and why his cause, hopefully, please God, will be opening up now in these times is also this normal humanity that we see. You know, like I think a lot of times they, they, they associate maybe even holy priest religious over here and this guy like this is this sense of humor that he had is his humanity and i think also because of also like the context the irish context we need normal you know priest figures yeah, yeah. i think of sister claire as well because if she someday hopefully please god soon if she's raised to the altars you're in you know, the context of irish nuns and mm -hmm. whatnot you get also this attractive young vibrant um funny holy mm. you know religious sister who you just kind of like peel back and you look at her life and you're just saying like she really was a normal person but like this is so important like when, when i read the life of sister claire she reminds me quite a lot of father willie i mean they they um they both impersonated other people you know practical jokes uh, and so on and that's a very important part of father willie's character i mean he i mean he had flaws like all of us you know i mean in the, in the golden legends of the saints they always seem to be born holy and you know there's a miracle surrounding their birth or whatever but that's the reality is we're all fallen and we all have to try and overcome our defects and in father willie's letters and in his particularly in his spiritual diaries you see this slow dedicated pursuit of holiness the ups and downs you know i mean very holy guy but sometimes you know he didn't do what he wanted to do you know and he wasn't always happy with himself and he had to try and reform himself again and again um but yet this this normality this humanity this this great love of practical jokes. I mean, there's one here. It's a letter home from the war and he's describing a um, 
plaque that he saw in a church and a letter home to his father and he said the plaque was erected by Misher X whatever his name was in honour of his dear wife Marie who lived 79 years 4 months 6 days they were married 55 years 9 months 2 days and 7 hours RIP and Willie's comment home to his father was there's nothing like being accurate but possibly this unfortunate man wanted to record that he had so much of his purgatory already done. <laughs> so, you know, he has this, this great uh, sense of humour, always playing jokes um, and trying to trying to cheer other people up all the time. So. Oh, that's great. No, it is like the normality. I encourage like everybody who's listening, please like this um, to raise the fallen. Um, I think we to get in contact with him right now through through his letters and what we have and to to promote the cause i think this is it is providential and especially to the irish audience mm. i think we need to because like what we're faced right now um i mean we work in secondary schools so it's just on a daily basis you're kind of like surrounded by a lot of negativity around clergy in general mm. priesthood but for us to have responses when you respond with somebody like this you know even just you could just even take a snippet out of one of yeah, his letters yeah. it's just we need to we really need to know these guys and like to have them so or what is a saint a saint is somebody who in a sense incarnates the gospel you know and uh, uh jesus says there's no greater love you have than to lay down your life for another well here's a priest who did that so you may be skeptical about the church you may be skeptical of pri- skeptical about priesthood here's a priest who would have died to save you and what's interesting is the two soldiers he died when he was uh, who, who he was trying to save when he died were non-Catholics. Oh, they were wow. Protestant soldiers from Northern Ireland, which is another important aspect of the story that's been forgotten over the last hundred years. You know, in, a, in an island with a religious and political division, here's a very unifying figure because he offered up his life actually for non-Catholic soldiers that he was trying to bring uh, to safety. Um, uh, I mean, in terms of other material that people can look at, if they look at the website, willydoyle.org, there's a lot of videos there. But it's updated every day with a quote from his writing uh, or something that, that's relevant to the particular day or feast day uh, related to Father Willie's spiritual writing. So there's a lot of material. I think there's actually, uh, it's based on a previous blog that I've been running for the last 12 years. So I think there's 4,700 pages of, of material there over those 12 years. So there's a lot of his writings and a lot of his letters. So there's a lot of archives to get stuck into. So that. you've been at this for, so this is your life really. Like well, <laughs> it's, it's a part of my life, but it's an important part. It's, uh, I first read the O'Reilly book 12 years ago. It was this time 12 years ago. I started reading the book by Alfred O'Reilly and I was just struck by what I was reading. And um, I live in Dunleary, so it's about two miles from where Father Willie was born and grew up and I'd never heard of him. And... Uh, I was like, how have I never heard of this man? And um, through a variety of circumstances, I set up a blog and, you know, didn't know how long I'd keep going with the blog, but just kept going. And people asked me to give talks and the opportunity to produce this book came along. And then uh, there's a great docudrama that EWTN has produced called Bravery Under Fire. You can find that on, uh, you can buy the DVD, you can find it on YouTube or you can find it on our website, willydoyle.org. And then over the last little while, we've been working at um, developing the Father Willie Doyle Association, uh, which is now, thank God, a, a private association of the faithful uh, approved by uh, the Diocese of Meath. So it has a, you know, a status in, in canon law and approval of the bishop there. And uh, we want to you know, go out and talk to people about Father Willie. If anyone wants to organize a talk, we'll be happy to go bring uh, the relics. Correct. There's a few other items we have as well. The items, by the way, I just want to say are on loan to us, to the Father Willie Doyle Association by the Jesuit Archives. So I want to thank them for entrusting us with those uh, very precious relics. Yeah. So, yeah, we want to, want to talk about Father Willie and uh, introduce people to him. Well, look, Pat, I've, like I said, I felt like this is, um, it was it was funny because it was this time last year in Lent when I first read Sister Claire's biography. And I felt like that was a huge renovation in my religious life. It's just when you read what other, you know, what they write and how they live things, it just, it, there's something about that. Mm-hmm. And now I feel like providentially this Lent as well, Father Willie's, he's been giving me a couple of uh, pointers now. I mean, there's mm-hmm. no pawns next to us, but like, <laughs> like so, I don't even know if I would be, <laughs> that one's, that one for me is, is a, that's yeah. a huge one, but like yeah. just to, to, to really kind of like a renovation of, of our priestly um, identity of this closeness to yeah. the heart of Christ. I feel impacted. Like I said, I've read, 
I haven't read the whole. I've seen the docu docudrama, and I've read a good number of these letters here. But there's already. I'm already feeling like an interior. And just listening here with the relics present, yeah. I'm saying like this is a big. Well, there's a lot more. I mean, for anyone who really wants to delve into his spiritual life, there's uh, the Arahali biography, which you can get on archive.org. And some people have reprinted it. It's it's an amazing book. But there's also a book that his brother wrote called Mary in God, M-E-R-R-Y, Mary in God. It's often uh, um, credited to Alfred Arahali, but it was actually written by Father Charlie Doyle, written anonymously. I'm not sure why he did it anonymously. And uh, there's another book, if you're interested in his war life, um, there's a book called Worshipper and Worshipped by Carol Hope, a uh, British uh, military writer. She comes out in the documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So very, very detailed account of his, his war years. Um, so there's a lot of information out there on Father Willie. But I think he's very important and Sister Claire are important because there are a lot of holy Irish people, but we're not really great at promoting them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's only one Irish person has been canonized in the last 500 years. Oh, wow. That's an incredible statistic, St. Oliver Plunkett. Uh, he's the only one who's been canonized wow. in 500 yeah. years. There's St. Charles of Mount Argus, who was Dutch. He died, lived and died in Ireland. Uh, so we suppose we could accept him as an adopted Irishman as well. But no one else from Ireland has been canonized in wow. over 500 yeah. years. A few beatified and a few more who are venerable. But there's a lot of holy men and women out there. And yeah. we need to remember our legacy, promote that legacy. We hear a lot about bad news. There's a lot of very holy, good, good people in our history. And we yeah. need to be proud of them and we need to bring our st bring their stories out to the fore. Yeah, no, and you're an instrument. And I, I guarantee you, Father Willie's, he's going to work big favors and miracles in your life as well. But that's what it takes. Like you've been 12 years with the blog. I'm sure this stuff doesn't just pop out. Like there's a lot of work, effort, dedication behind it. You're a family man as well. So hopefully it encourages people to, if they get inspired, if they, they stumble upon somebody, I mean, Frank Duff's one, like, I think he's got a legion yep. behind him. But, oh, like, yep. you, you know, I think you have been inspired. So God bless you and your family. Um, Thank you. I, I think we're going to leave everybody with the blessing. We'll bless them with uh, Father Willie's crucifix. And um, check out, definitely, To Raise the Fallen and Father Willie Doyle. And please, if you're Irish as well, get this. We need to really make this ours because these guys, they've got a lot to say for us, especially now. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Lord, for this conversation. We ask you to bless Pat and his family, all those who are listening. And please, God, um, the the case for Father Willie Doyle can be opened up soon, and we can come to know him more, and he can come to help us through his intercession. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, guys.